My grandfather was a Christian pastor in Germany. He always said he was born on the wrong side of the ocean at the wrong time of history. Uh, he was drafted into the German army along with every able-bodied person right as the Second World War began in 1939 and uh, immediately placed on a frontline unit, Unit 699, that was placed in the heart of Russia and moving through the Ukraine and into Russia in the southern flank. They were heading for the city of Baku for their goal was to basically capture the oil reserves of the Russian armies and the Russian government. And uh, being on a bridge building unit right at the front lines, often behind enemy lines, there were huge amounts of casualties and, and a lot of, lot of heartache. One day, his commanding officer towards the end of the war called him into his office, his makeshift office, and asked him a very direct question. He said, Herr Hazel, do you believe that Germany is going to win this war? And the question was kind of a catch-22, because if you're a patriotic soldier, you're going to say, of course we're going to win this war. But also being a Bible student and as pastor and having studied prophecy, my grandfather knew that, that Germany would not win the war. And so he was conflicted, and he didn't know exactly what to say. And at that moment, he said a silent prayer to heaven. And then he said, is this an official or an unofficial question? They had kind of an unwritten code within their unit that when they had their hats off, they could speak on an unofficial capacity. And so the commanding officer stopped for a moment and then he said, okay, it's unofficial. And he took off his hat and placed it on his desk and my grandfather did the same. And he pulled out a Bible from his pocket, opened it up to Daniel chapter 2 and began to tell the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he said, well, I don't believe that Hitler is correct. His empire cannot last a thousand years as he's promising the German people. This war has to fail because of biblical prophecy and how everything has been fulfilled in the past. Nearly 2,500 years ago, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had a dream. Now, it's been said that this dream revealed the history of Earth from that time until today. Now, is this actually true? In order to find out, we need to go back to the book of Daniel. Daniel was taken captive about 605 B.C. According to the book, he was taken captive right about the beginning of the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar II, who uh, established the resurgence of Babylon as a very strong power in the ancient Near East. He took a number of princes from the city of Jerusalem captive, one of whom was Daniel. It was, it was not unusual that conquerors, kings who conquered the land, would take from royal families and nobility young people and take them with them to their own country. And it was mainly done for two reasons. One reason is that these young people will be educated in Babylon. And they would accept not only language of Babylonians, but they would accept culture and religion and everything from Babylon. They would take the cream of the crop, the intelligentsia, the royalty. Uh, they would take the artisans, the, the writers, the physicians, so that their land was um, developed at a high level. But they would leave some of the people uh, in the land and allow a local person to rule. That's exactly what happened with the time of Daniel. Daniel and his friends were taken from Jerusalem to Babylonia. We find Daniel captive in Babylon. Now, Daniel chapter 1 tells us why he's there, okay? Nebuchadnezzar had gone to Jerusalem in three separate raids. The first one was in 605 B.C. Then there was another one around 598 B.C. and another one around 586 B.C. Each time, the penalty against the people of Jerusalem was a little bit more severe. It may have been in that initial attack in 605 when Daniel and his friends, princes of the kingdom, were taken into captivity with the idea of training them and making them sympathetic supporters of the Babylonian crown. This piece chronicles events from 605 to 594 BC, including Nebuchadnezzar's campaign into Palestine and the first capture of Jerusalem. Daniel was probably brought back to Babylon on the first raid by Nebuchadnezzar. He comes to Babylon and he is enrolled in the schools of the Babylonians. He's given a Babylonian name, he's fed Babylonian food. He is enrolled in their schools in a kind of Babylonian brainwashing to prepare him to assimilate to Babylonian culture, 
and language, and eventually to be a kind of puppet ruler over the Jews for the Babylonian Empire. He risked his life by insisting on remaining pure in the way that he ate in his diet and so on, and what he drank, rather than just accepting the hospitality of the king. Now, that was extraordinarily dangerous. And if you don't accept the hospitality, that is a serious insult. Now, you see, that can be dangerous even if you're equals with somebody. But Daniel was not the e equal with Nebuchadnezzar. He was a captive. He was being treated with a massive blessing and compliment from the king, the great king who had conquered all these other kingdoms. And yet he refused his hospitality. This was very dangerous. But God blessed him. He got through that. And he became much wiser than all of the other uh, wise men. One of the most fascinating stories in the Bible is the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Ch Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has dreams, the Bible says. It was his second year of his reign, and uh, he wakes up completely disturbed because he's had this amazing dream, and like something that happens to so many of us, he wakes up and he doesn't remember what he dreamed. He dreamt a dream that terrified the daylights out of him. Now, this has got to be quite a dream to terrify this kind of king. He knows it's from the gods. He just conquered all this territory, but it still frightens him. He doesn't know what it means. Obviously, to him, uh, as many other people in the Near East thought, as well as Pharaoh in the book of Genesis, he thought this had something to do with him and his future and his kingdom, but he didn't know what. And what's more, in the morning he had that impression, but he forgot what the details of the dream were, so he couldn't even remember it. It's Fascinating, when you look at archaeological evidence, tablets that have been dug up from 6th century Babylon, we find that dreams were a common part of Babylonian existence, you know, particularly among the priestly class, among uh, the elite class. Uh, there was a whole school of how to deal with dreams. They had books on how to interpret and define dreams. So that actually, that description of the king having a dream and having someone come in to interpret it fits right in with the 6th century context. The greatest a tested genre of Babylonian literature that we have is divination literature, omens like that. In other words, what I'm saying is that if you took all of the Babylonian written materials that we have and you put them all together in a library, the biggest section would be this one. Babylon is steeped in religious meaning, connotations, overtones, undertones. And that's the world that, that Daniel lived in. And this is the context in which Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. He was filled, his, his life was filled with symbolism. And so for him to have received a dream that was so symbolic would have really meant something significant to him. He would have realized this is more than just an un, you know, a strange dream. It has meaning. If a dream was not interpreted, it was perceived as dangerous or it was perceived as a curse. That's why people had to fight for finding the interpretation of the dream. So therefore he called all of his wise men who were supposed to deal with dreams and visions and interpreting them and omens and divination and all that stuff. Um, and they were the ones who, who knew about the gods and how to get in touch with them. So he calls them all together. For some reason Daniel wasn't there. We don't know exactly why. Maybe they just neglected to call him because he's a, a young colleague of the rest of them. Um, we don't know. Maybe there was some politicking going on. Maybe some of the others were jealous and didn't want to call him. All right, so Nebuchadnezzar has all of these people and, he's, and he says, all right, I've had this dream and I want you to tell me the interpretation. So they say, oh, that's, that's fine. We're in that business. Tell us the dream. Oh no, I don't remember the dream. You're gonna tell me what the dream is. And he goes so far as to say, I have decided firmly, if you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. He is demanding of these wise men that they tell the king the content of the dream. And they get upset. They know they're going to die if uh, they don't do this. And uh, so they're really working hard against this. And you know what they do? They say, as it says there in Daniel, now wait a minute, king. They're fighting for the lives now. There is no king on earth that would ever ask such a difficult question. The king basically says, I'm not going to be persuaded by your time-saving tactics, okay? 
if you tell me what the dream is, then I can have confidence in your interpretation. I don't remember what the dream was, and that's what I need you to do for me. After all, you're the magicians, you're the astrologers, you're the soothsayers. Tell me the dream. They were paid, they were enrolled, they were uh, on the divine payroll for the purpose of knowing what others didn't know. They had access to secret information. And so it was reasonable for the king to ask this. And so the king decides that he's going to have them all killed. All of his top advisors, all of his magicians, astrologers, his, his uh, sorcerers, his enchanters. And the story or the decree comes to Daniel and his three friends. And they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, Daniel, as we've already said, had gone through the schooling of the Babylonians. And so he was apparently numbered with the wise men. He was numbered with those that were being killed. As the story unfolds, one of the king's guards arrives at Daniel's house for the purpose of executing him. That must have been awkward, right? Knock, knock, knock. Hello, what can I do for you? Daniel, yes, I'm here to kill you. He answered and said to Ariok, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? What's going on here? Why all the haste? Why all of the urgency? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. He must have said something like, well, listen, the king's had a dream. He can't remember the dream, but he knows it's important. He has an anxiety associated with this dream. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Instead of fearing for their lives, they decide to have a prayer time together. And Daniel asks, and his friends ask, that the Lord would give them not only the interpretation of the dream, but the dream as well. And so the first word of verse 19, then the secret was revealed. What do you mean then? Well, after he prayed, after he asked. So Daniel at this point is rushed into the presence of the king. And then Daniel explains to the king the dream. It's interesting, though, what Daniel says at the beginning. He says to the king, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about it, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. I can just imagine when Daniel came in and the king said with surprise, can you tell me the content of my dream? And Daniel said, I cannot tell you the dream because of my wisdom, but there's a God who reveals secrets. And the king was listening because that sounds good, but he hadn't heard the content of the dream yet. Because remember, the king doesn't recall the dream. But you can be sure that if he starts to hear it, you know how that is when you can't quite remember something and someone says, oh, is it, is it this, is it this? Oh, yeah, 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 that's it. Okay? So he's waiting with bated breath. What will the dream be? And then... Daniel said, O oh, king, yes, the king said, that's right, I'm king. O oh, king, you looked and saw, yes, I saw. Now, what did I see? I can just see the king leaning forward in his chair. And then Daniel says, O oh, king, you saw an image. And as soon as Daniel had uttered that one word, image, he had won the day. Verse 31, you, O oh, king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold and its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So here he describes a great metal man, okay? The head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and the feet partly of iron and partly of clay, okay? Very simple, a statue, an image, an idol. So you see descending value in terms of the metals, but perhaps increasing strength, except for the iron and clay at the bottom. So it's a very intriguing dream. And the context of Daniel suggests that in the sixth century, Daniel was shown a vision of the entire future of the world from Nebuchadnezzar's time until 
this stone kingdom, which seems to be something that happens at the very end of Earth's history. But he goes on to explain not only what the king dreamed, this image with a head of gold and arms and chest of silver and thighs of brass and bronze and legs of iron and feet of iron mixed with clay, but he goes on to tell the king what those things represent. Verse 37. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and he has made you ruler over them all. Now look at these words here. You are this head of gold. Okay? No need to wonder, no need to question, no need to guess. Daniel says it. You, Nebuchadnezzar, and by extension, the kingdom that you represent, Babylon, you are this head of gold. Uh, after, of course, consulting his own God, he's told that these medals represent a sequence of various kingdoms. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar that you, O king, are this head of gold. The head of gold represents Babylon. And that's very appropriate that that be the symbol for Babylon, which was gilded in gold famous for its gold. Babylon was one of the most spectacular cities of the ancient world. If you look at the size of Babylon, it was larger than Rome, larger than Athens. It was just an enormous city that was situated just about 25 miles south of Baghdad in modern Iraq. Historians tell us that there was more gold in Babylon, and probably they're using hyperbole, but you can get a feel for the richness of ancient Babylon, that there was more gold in Babylon than there was dust. It was the great golden kingdom of antiquity. Excavations that have taken place there beginning in 1899 by the Germans have revealed a city that was surrounded by triple walls. The walls of Babylon consisted of actually two systems of walls. And they surrounded the city and these two systems, each one consisted of three separate walls. So you had a total of six walls surrounding the whole city. It was massive. This brick is actually a brick from the walls of Babylon. Every brick made during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar was stamped with his name in it. There were over 200 pagan temples. The famous ziggurat, of course, was the central uh, temple. Uh, and many gods were worshipped. Nebuchadnezzar built many altars, temples, sanctuaries, um, and it was a very polytheistic society, a very sophisticated society. The literature and the language was something that at that time the Akkadian language was basically the lingua franca of the world like English is today. Anyone doing commerce, anyone doing any kind of diplomatic relations would be communicating in that language and so the Babylonian Empire not only spread, but it was very influential as well. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like the idea that he was only the head of gold. He wanted to be the whole thing. And so he set up a great image of gold where the whole thing was of gold in Daniel chapter 3, the very next chapter, and he had a lot of his people bow down and worship. Now William Shea has pointed out that this was possibly a time of conflict in the empire when there was some uh, possible disloyalty to Nebuchadnezzar going on, so he was having everyone pledge loyalty to him. When you read the document coming from Babylon, we discover that in about the 10th year of his reign, a rebellion broke out. And the rebellion was so severe at one point in his court that the text says that he had to take his own sword and defend his own life. Fortunately, Soldiers came in and he was able to survive this rebellion. And of course, those involved were punished, executed. But the problem was Nebuchadnezzar did not know who else was involved in this rebellion, in this, in this, in this plot. So he is asking that court officials would pledge new allegiance to him. And he is bringing the people into the Babylon just to make sure that they understand that they have to be obedient to him, they have to accept him as sovereign king and ruler. Now this comes very, very close to the events of chapter 3, where we do have the statue he built and people who were there 
was supposed to bow down and pay respect. We have a list on the tablet mentioning about 100 names of the people who were invited to Babylon to pledge this new allegiance. And among these names, there are three names which are very similar to those three young men that we read in the Bible, in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, they did not bow down. Sedrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were uh, nobility. They were friends of Daniel. They were part of the upper elite society of Jerusalem. And all uh, three of them with Daniel were taken as captives to uh, be trained in Nebuchadnezzar's court. Those who don't bow down, which are the friends of Daniel, he has them thrown into a, a fiery furnace and heated up very hot. It's like a brick kiln. And just Nobody could survive anywhere near it. In fact, the people that threw them in were killed. But the fact that the whole image is of gold really shows that Nebuchadnezzar is rebelling against the vision of Daniel chapter 2. He's not accepting that God is just allowing him to be the head of gold. He wants to be the whole thing and go to the end and reign forever. And so he has some hard lessons to learn. Because in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, Babylon is not a temporary kingdom. Babylon is the apex of all kingdoms. It is the unending kingdom. And so Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, you are this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar must have loved that. But he didn't love what came next. Take a look at verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then a third kingdom of bronze which shall bear rule over all the earth. Nebuchadnezzar was listening to that and probably didn't like it, but he heard in Daniel chapter 2, 39, that after you, that's after you, Nebuchadnezzar, after the Babylonian kingdom, another kingdom will come. Now, I'm sure that Nebuchadnezzar did not like those two words there, after you. But Daniel says, after you, another kingdom will arise, and then a third kingdom of bronze. So now you get a feel for what the interpretation of the dream is. The gold represents Babylon. After that, the silver represents another kingdom. And then a third kingdom of bronze. And then that critical phrase there, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now, here's a critical thing to understand. That phrase, which shall bear rule over all the earth, lets you know that these are not mere regional or tribal powers. These are world-ruling entities, world-ruling powers. Babylon was the greatest nation of antiquity up to that point. But Babylon would be succeeded by another kingdom. Well, the conquest of Babylon is rather interesting. The Persians come up to the city and they surround the city. Of course, from the book of Daniel's perspective, Belshazzar the king is trapped in there with his uh, nobility. And they feel quite safe. The walls of Babylon were very sturdy, very strong. Belshazzar knows that Cyrus is invading, that he's approaching, but he's not afraid. Babylon is invincible. It's got the walls around the city, it's got canals, it's got moats, and it's safe. One of the key features of the city of Babylon was that the Euphrates River ran through uh, the city. That was a source of water uh, for the inhabitants of the city, and you couldn't just break into the city. The gates were very well constructed, and the river itself, there were uh, special barred gates that came down into the river, making it impossible for anyone to sneak into the city through the river course. And Babylon, in fact, was uh, under the rule of, of Belshazzar when it fell, on the night that it fell, according to Daniel chapter 5, when the armies of Cyrus under this general came and they got into the walls. And uh, the Greek historian refers to the idea that, in fact, the armies of Cyrus diverted the waters of the river Euphrates. Uh, the Persians were able to divert the water by building a canal uh, upstream and diverting the course of the river so that the water level going through the city actually dropped very low and the Persian soldiers were able to slip underneath the water gate into the city itself while uh, the guards and other people of Babylon apparently were partying at Belshazzar's last party and they were able to go in and take over the city that way. Once you break into the city, open up the rest of the gates and the Persian army can race in and take over. Belshazzar gets reports that cities are falling. So is he celebrating because he feels secure? That's what many say. 
Is he celebrating to drown out the fact that he knows the empire is about to fall? That's what some say. In any case, he's feasting and he brings out the beautiful um, goblets and vessels that were in storage from the Israelites' sanctuary, from Solomon's temple. And they're feasting. And they get very drunk and then they see this writing on the wall. Belshazzar is terrified of what's going on, of what he sees, and he calls for Daniel. And Daniel interprets this for him. It is a matter of time, a matter of hours, before the, the empire is about to fall. Babylon was the greatest nation of antiquity up to that point. But Babylon would be succeeded by another kingdom. And that kingdom would be succeeded by still another kingdom. Each of these metals representing a kingdom and then a subsequent kingdom. Okay? Babylon conquered by Medo-Persia. The Medo-Persian Empire being represented by the silver, the chest and arms. In fact, the Medo-Persian Empire is called Medo-Persia by name right in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 8. Cyrus, king of uh, Persia, with his general Ugbaru Gobrias, took over in 539. Now the Persians were a very powerful empire, and they had quite an enlightened rule in a, in a sense. Cyrus could be brutal on various places, so for example there were cities that got in his way that wouldn't surrender, and he burned the whole city with men, women, and children. However, those cities that submitted to his rule, he was very nice to. And he, in fact, let captives go free to their homes, including the Jews, back to Judah. And he returned gods to their temples and did all kinds of things. Now, the Persian Empire went on. And of course, when a king has a big army and lots of power, he wants to expand his empire. That's every king's dream, right? So one of these kings in the 400s, his name was Xerxes. His Persian name in Old Persian, which is his original native language, is Shayarsha. But that was hard for the Jews to pronounce. So they said Ahasuerus, we know him as Ahasuerus, and the Greeks said Herhes, which is Xerxes, okay? He was the husband of Queen Esther. The young girl Esther lived during the Persian period, during the time of Xerxes I. Now the Bible and the biblical text, uh, the king that eventually married this young Jewish girl was actually called Ahasuerus. Now, I don't know what Esther called him, whether she called him Shayarsha or Ahasuerus, but in any case, that was her husband. And this guy was power hungry. He was also really weird, had a very short temper. And uh, he wanted to conquer Greece. He invaded Greece, expanded the Persian Empire, the son of Darius, of course, and really established these major uh, capital cities and palaces, finished them that his father Darius had started them, but he finished them, places like Susa and Persepolis and some of these um, fantastic cities of the Persian Empire. But you can imagine the Greeks never forgot what the Persians had done to them. So years later, see this was in the 400s, over a century later, Alexander the Great rose up. His father was Philip of Macedon, Macedonia is to the north of Greece. And he then took over Greece and the Greeks and the Macedonians had not forgotten what the Persians did, and they wanted revenge. And so they all got behind Alexander, and he went over and he defeated the main Persian army in three great battles, Issus, Granicus, and Arbela in the 330s, captured Darius III, the last king. The Greeks had been in tension with the Persians for quite some time. There had been several uh, conflicts. The Persians had tried to invade Greece several times. And ultimately, under Alexander the Great, he was able to put a stop to the Persian and, uh, Persians once and for all in this great battle where he takes on Darius the Persian and wipes out the Persian army. Alexander the Great, 331, on the field of Arbela, a marvelous battle in which, though he was outnumbered significantly, he defeats the Medo-Persian armies. Alexander had assembled a group of infantry and cavalry, numbering about 49,000 men. Darius outnumbered him by some estimates by 10 to 1, 
about 500,000 men, some estimates as high as a million. So you can see that Alexander was way outnumbered in that particular battle, but he had developed quite a few um, tactics, like the phalanx and other tactics from his father that he used very successfully in battle. And um, at one point in the battle, it got so intense that Darius just turned his horse around and fled, which was a signal for his entire army to do the same. And Alexander basically won battles several times that way um, with Darius fleeing. If it had been a different king, if it had been a different time, and perhaps some biblical scholars quote the passage that says that God will strike fear into the hearts of kings. Perhaps this was a divine moment where God was deciding another empire was going to take over. Whatever the case may be, Alexander won when simply on human basis he shouldn't have won. So you see this transition from Babylon to another kingdom, Medo-Persia, to a third kingdom of bronze which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now we come to the thighs which are bronze. This is the uh, Greek Empire. That third kingdom is also mentioned exactly in Daniel chapter 8. It's the kingdom of Greece, or as it says in the Bible, Grecia. Okay? So, Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece. In other words, there is no room for interpretation here. It just labels it. So you see, there we have a historical anchor point. We know that Daniel is using these symbols, whether different kinds of metals, parts of a big image, or different animals, to refer to a succession of empires which come up and which particularly dominate the Middle East and the territory of God's people. The Greek Empire is a very uh, apt description for a world empire to succeed the Persian Empire. And again, that's an element Daniel seems to accurately reflect, the succession of empires. Even though Alexander was so powerful, so intelligent, had been trained by the greatest Grecian philosopher, none other than Aristotle, unfortunately it turned out that Alexander, while he could conquer kingdoms, and stand on top of the world, as it were, could not seem to conquer himself. He had conquered the world, but he wasn't able to conquer his own demons, and he died in Babylon, leaving the empire no clear successor, and four of his generals took over, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, who divided up the empire in different parts, which fits perfectly the picture that we have in Daniel chapter 8. So, Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece. Now, watch what happens with the next kingdom. Very interesting, beginning in verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. He devotes more time to this fourth kingdom than any of the other kingdoms. Okay? Now, when you look at this fourth kingdom, he says it will be extremely strong, extremely potent, extremely powerful, symbolized by iron. It will crush in pieces and break all of these other kingdoms. Okay? And that kingdom is none other than the great iron monarchy of Rome. Only one kingdom would fit. The Roman Republic turns into the Roman Empire and it becomes yet the greatest of all of these succession of empires yet. It's the strongest. Uh, it's depicted apparently in Daniel has the kingdom of iron and certainly uh, Rome in terms of its raw strength, its wealth, its riches, its glory may not have been as great as Babylon or Persia or Greece, but in terms of raw strength, uh, none of the previous kingdoms su could surpass Rome and so iron seems an apt description uh, for the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was an empire known as a military empire, an empire known for its uh, well-trained armies for its tenacity, for its organization. Known for their ferocity, known for their military strength and might, as well as a well-refined culture. Now Jesus was alive during the time of the Roman Empire, right? Jesus was nailed to a Roman cross. Jesus was watched by Roman soldiers. Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, a Roman governor. 
and of course crucifixion and the kinds of uh, methods that crucifixion entailed just shows again the might of the Roman Empire and, and their characterization in the Bible as, as an empire of iron. So you have the long legs of iron, right? The long legs of iron, representing Rome, were not conquered. Rome wasn't conquered from outside by a stronger, greater, more potent military power. Rome was divided. Well, I wonder what the prophecy says about that. Let's see what it says. Verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, look at these five words, the kingdom shall be divided. The kingdom shall be what? Divided. The kingdom will be divided. In other words, there will not be a conquering of this fourth iron kingdom, but the division of it. The kingdom will be divided. And the final phase, which is not a kingdom, but it's uh, following Rome, it's a breakup into iron and clay, which don't really mix together. So it's, it's sort of a division of the Roman Empire. In verse 41 it says, just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. So the iron continues, but it is now divided. And that's precisely what happened in this history of the Roman Empire as it moved from the domination of Rome to the division of Europe. We have a number of tribes, a number of barbaric tribes that come in and begin to cause havoc in the Roman Empire already early on. And then as time goes by, Rome as an empire loses its power. After Rome would come a divided kingdom. It would be part clay and part iron and they would not cleave together. They would not stick together. They would be in the form of a body part, but they would not be a single kingdom. I mean, some of the great men in history, this has been their passion to bring about a kind of cohesiveness, a kind of unity in Europe, and yet the Bible says it's not going to happen. There were attempts. The story of Daniel seems to um, you know, have this competing kingdom at the end of iron and clay. And it's interesting when you look at the history of Europe, uh, you see parts of uh, the disintegrating Holy Roman Empire remain strong. And there's different uh, countries will at times emerge with great strength. The Franks will emerge, you know, Charlemagne, you know, uh, through the Middle Ages, different kingdoms seem to come to a predominance, but none of them quite are able to hang on to power. Uh, and this has been sort of the history of uh, Europe all the way from the disintegration of Rome through the Holy Roman Empire through the Middle Ages to the present. I suppose you could suggest Napoleon was one of the more recent examples of trying to unite uh, Europe into one kingdom like had happened in Roman times or Greek times or Persian or Babylonian times. But he doesn't succeed. It fragments. The rest of the iron and clay join up against him and the French Empire falls. The prophecy says, and history confirms, that Rome was not conquered from outside, but divided. It was divided. And then it says something amazing. It says that they would mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now that's kind of an awkward phrase, kind of an unusual phrase, but what it means is very simple. It means that they would try to bring unity to the nations of divided Rome by a kind of artificial nuptial bond. That is to say that they would try to bring about unity through marriage. And this is exactly what the history of Europe reveals. And one of the main ways that they tried to get unified was through intermarriage of their families, as Daniel says. And we're talking about long, long after uh, the time of Daniel. This is incredible. In fact, one of the main people who was doing this kind of intermarriage was um, Maria Theresa in the 1700s, the time of Mozart. She ruled over the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. And she had a lot of children, especially daughters. She had a lot of daughters. And she married them to all kinds of other rulers. They didn't have a choice, most of them. One did. Her favorite daughter had a choice. So she gained power by having it all in the family, you see. 
And that's the way they tried to control uh, Europe. The Duke of this country would marry the Duchess of that country. The King of this country would marry the Queen of that country. The Prince of this country would marry the Princess of this country, all the while trying to bring about an artificial unity, thinking that family ties and family bonds would bind the nations of divided Rome together in such a way that they would once again be unified. Now, as if that's not amazing enough, the text says that it wouldn't work, that it wouldn't cleave or adhere together. Even though they attempted uh, to have unity through intermarriage, it did not work because the prophecy is sure. These countries will not cleave together, no matter what humans might try. The critic says, too accurate, too precise, must have been written after the division of Rome sometime. Okay? Everybody agrees Daniel is accurate. So the question is, was it written before, with the traditional authorship, 500 to 600 years before the time of Jesus? Or was it written sometime after the division of Rome, 500 to 600 years after the time of Jesus? That's the question. Yes, from the standpoint of an archaeologist, I would say that uh, we have a lot of new evidence in um, the last uh, uh, several years that supports the historicity and the accuracy of um, the book of Daniel. How do we know then that the book of Daniel was in fact written before the events that it describes? Well, one of the pieces of evidence that confirms that is the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947. In those scrolls, which was basically this religious community's library, was found every book from the Old Testament, at least portions of every book from the Old Testament, except the book of Esther. Wait a minute. If portions of every book except the book of Esther were found, what book was found there? Daniel. Daniel. The Dead Sea Scrolls already have the book of Daniel as a canonical book of Scripture, belonging to the collection of Scripture. And if the book of Daniel was just only produced in the second century, about 165, how would you find so soon after that this book of Daniel included in canonical scripture? It just doesn't make sense. Now think this through with me. Even secular archaeologists, secular scholars date the Dead Sea Scrolls to 250 to 50 BC. That is to say somewhere between 250 years before the time of Christ and 50 years before the time of Christ. You tracking with me? Now, if we have the book of Daniel some 200 years or 250 or 150 years before the time of Jesus, then guess what? We have a very good indicator that the traditional date of authorship that is attributed to the book of Daniel, namely 500, 600 BC, is the correct one. So rather than be seeing it as a late work that is full of errors, that are not historical or not trustworthy, I, can, I think we can say the opposite, that we have enough evidence to uh, favor uh, sixth century dating for the book and the um, accuracy of the material that's found there. Now watch what happens next in the dream. Verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Nebuchadnezzar believed that God lived, lived in mountains. So God is using his understanding, and he is choosing that the rock is taken from the mountain and sent to destroy the statue so Nebuchadnezzar would know from the beginning that it is not that other kingdom will come to destroy the kingdoms of the world, but it will be something that comes from God. In this particular context in Daniel, it is precisely a rock being cut without hands. In other words, not something that humans are doing, but something divine that is happening. 
that will establish a kingdom that will last forever, that will take the place of all these other earthly kingdoms. Let's consider who the rock is and what that mountain is that fills the earth. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, we're told that the rock that followed them in the wilderness was Christ. Very interesting. And then in Deuteronomy 33, 3 and 4, God calls himself the rock. He sees coming out of the, from his peripheral, this stone flies through the air and it hits the, the image, shatters the image. This is Christ. This is the coming of Christ. And then he said, this represents the kingdom of God, which is coming to human history to intervene, to take over from all of these kingdoms of the world. And then this becomes a great kingdom that fills the whole world and he reigns forever and ever. Remember with me that the book of Daniel was written some 500 years before the time of Jesus. Okay? 500 years before the time of Jesus. Staggering. I mean, you couldn't tell me what's going to happen in the next five minutes, much less the next five centuries. Daniel's writing in the time of Babylon, and he foretells, really, if you divide the prophecy, up into seven sections. He really foretells seven things, okay? He said there would be Babylon and there was Babylon, that's one. The prophecy says there would be Medo-Persia and there was Medo-Persia, that's two. The prophecy says there would be Greece and there was Greece and that's three. The prophecy says there would be Rome and there was Rome and that's four. It says that Rome would be divided and Rome was divided, that's five. It says that Rome would continue to be divided despite overtures, both political and marital, to bring a unity and it is still divided to this day. That's six. The only thing left to be fulfilled in this prophecy is that stone hitting the image and God establishing his own kingdom, which will never be destroyed. The commanding officer stopped for a moment and then he said, okay, it's unofficial. And he took off his hat and placed it on his desk and my grandfather did the same. And he pulled out a Bible from his pocket, opened it up to Daniel chapter two and began to tell the story of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The image with a head of gold and arms and chest of silver and thighs of bronze and legs of iron and feet of iron mixed with clay and went through the world empires that those represented. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. And he said, we're now living down in the period of the disintegration of the Roman Empire after, after Rome fell and this is Europe today and this, this feet of iron mixed with clay and just as iron does not mix with clay that's the time period that we're living in. And so I don't believe that Hitler is correct. His empire cannot last a thousand years as he's promising the German people. This war has to fail because of biblical prophecy and how everything has been fulfilled in the past. His commanding officer was very thoughtful when the Bible study was over and then he said, could I see your Bible? I'd like to keep this. And my grandfather said, okay, and he handed over the Bible. And he said, I want you to be here again tomorrow morning at nine o'clock you're dismissed. The next day he showed up at nine o'clock and uh, only to see that there were two other high-ranking officers on other, either side of his commanding officer and at that moment as he walked into the office he thought oh no for sure I've been betrayed but then his commanding officer took off his hat told the other two officers what their arrangement was and that everything that would be spoken would be not repeated again and handed back my grandfather his Bible and my grandfather opened it up to Daniel 2 as he was told that he would have to tell that Bible study all over again. And so that's what he did. He went through the Bible study, went through each of those medals on that, on that image, and as he went through those medals, he talked about the dates. And every time he mentioned an empire like Babylon and the dates of 605 to 539, he noticed some communication going between his officer and the other two officers, kind of imperceptible, but there. And he continued the Bible study and came to the end and said, we are now living in the time period of the feet of iron mixed with clay and they do not cleave to one another and for that reason, we will not have a unified European or world empire that's gonna last a thousand years. Hitler's Third Reich cannot last a thousand years. And as he delivered that, that message, there was silence in the room. He was dismissed again and as he was leaving, the commanding officer said, oh, by the way, I should introduce you to the other two gentlemen here. And he said, this is, this is a captain, and prior to his, his time here in the German army and his drafting into the German army, he was a professor of history. And 
Then he was introduced to the other gentleman, too, who had been a professor of history as well in his civilian days just before the war. He says, both of these men have corroborated all the dates that you provided and the sequence and the history that you've provided here. Thank you very much. Several months later, in May of 1945, the war ended. And as they were now faced with the whole uh, issue of retreating and going back to Germany, what had taken them months and years to accomplish, uh, the big question was, how are they, how are they gonna make it? But unknown to my grandfather and to the rest of the unit, this commanding officer, having co been convinced several months earlier, had rationed every ounce of gasoline, every bit of food possible, because he knew that this war would end soon, based on that Bible study, and that they would have to retreat. You know, as he told me that story later, he said, and there's been a book published now on this story called A Thousand Shall Fall, of the original 1,200 men that were in his unit, only seven survived, which is remarkable when you think about it because my grandfather was a strong, had a strong conviction not to bear arms and he carried a wooden pistol with him that he had carved while he was in France at the first part of the war that he carried with him for the rest of the war and nobody ever knew that but he, he, he wasn't armed the entire time. And my grandfather often said afterwards that he believed that God had really been with him, that he had been protected and that it was for moments like those when he was able to bear testimony of God's word and biblical prophecy that made, had made all the difference for him and for his family and for his life. Before I was exposed to prophecy, Daniel 2, as well as Daniel 7 and other prophecies in Daniel, I was completely disinterested in religion, had no interest. I had no awareness of religion. And so seeing that prophecy uh, played an enormous and determinative role in my personal conversion to Christ and in my present confidence in the Bible. There are two things in my mind that make the Bible itself a very relevant and a very real book to me today. The one thing is prophecy that you can see fulfilled over the history of time. Um, the other is as we do more and more excavations as archaeologists and we're finding these ancient cities and these ancient civilizations that the Bible talks about, whether it's Babylon or Medo-Persia or Rome or Greece, whatever it is, we're able to tangibly touch the past. We're able to see it in a three-dimensional way. And the Bible just comes to life in a way that, that is very powerful. So this detail just gives you the idea that, in fact, there was some great mind behind this who can read the future. Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9, I am God and there is no other. I am God, he says, and there is none like me. And then he gives us the evidence. What was the evidence that God advanced that he was God? Declaring from ancient times the things that are not yet done. Prophecy.